Well, welcome to our fourth day together. Um, our theme for today uh, is spiritual pluralism. And the spiritual law, a direct quote uh, from John Templeton's Wisdom from World Religions, is this. Our present religious views, while worthy, may be neither final nor complete. So we have to let that uh, settle in for a few moments to really capture some sense of just how extraordinary a statement it is uh, for uh, anyone to make. Our present religious views, while worthy, may be neither final nor complete. Um, and this is a statement that some will find liberating and welcome and others may find challenging. Because after all, it does call into question the finality uh, of uh, religious beliefs and practices. And for many religious people, and for many people influenced by childhood religious traditions that stay with them into adulthood, this is part of what it means for them to be religious, the belief that their system of ideas and practices is the final system, the best system, the complete system, the only system in some cases, or at least the only system for us. And this statement of John uh, Templeton's flies directly in the face of that. And as, as, as extraordinary a claim as it is, it's by no means unique in the history of religion, especially in the mystical traditions of the world's religions, what to speak of the mystical traditions outside of the religious traditions. Such an understanding of religious views and practices is fairly common, if not always uncontroversial. It's often controversial. And so today, um, the learning objectives for this video are uh, to distinguish between, to help us to get a sense of how Sir John could make such a claim, the learning objectives can make that clear, perhaps. Uh, today, I'd like to help us distinguish between religious and theological beliefs on one side and mystical or spiritual beliefs on the other side. Um, secondly, I'd like to uh, identify some of the limitations um, that uh, make religious language sometimes incapable of expressing the fullness of the spiritual life. Another thing I'd like to do is to contrast the changing uh, parts of the world's religions from the unchanging parts, to distinguish between the temporary and the permanent aspects in religion. And finally, uh, since our theme is spiritual pluralism, I want to speak about some of the benefits of spiritual pluralism and also uh, some of its risks. So, um, the first uh, thing I'd like to say is that in, in the history of most philosophically developed religious traditions, there's a basic distinction that's made between the divine or the ultimate reality in itself and our experience of it. There's a lot of language and multiple traditions. It's very technical, jargony language. Um, my, I'll just give you one, one pair, not to overburden us with jargon. It's the difference between apophatic and cataphatic understandings of reality. Now, the theologians and the philosophers will probably be familiar with that language. The language isn't as important as the distinction. And the basic distinction is that there is a, a gap or a divide between the way reality ultimately is and the way we envision it. And this is an extremely, extraordinarily helpful idea to keep in mind. It's part of what uh, endows us with our inalienable uh, religious freedom. Because the fact of the matter is, is that if the divine or the ultimate reality or being is infinite, how can it po be possible that a finite language, a finite set of stories could exhaust the fullness of the divine reality? It's obvious that a finite vessel cannot contain an infinite, uh, an infinite uh, reality. Now, this doesn't mean that religious traditions are false insofar as they fail to capture the fullness of the divine life. What it means is that they are, are limited in their capacity to express that fullness. It doesn't mean they're not effective. Each religious tradition can be seen as something like a sacrament, if you will, to take a Catholic term, a term also found in the Greek tradition. You can also find correlates in other traditions as well. 
Each religious tradition can be seen as a vessel that contains some of the divine life and communicates it effectively to its adherents. But this in no way invalidates the fact that another religious tradition, standing alongside this tradition, also performs that same uh, mediating function for the people who follow it. It's this insight that gives rise to spiritual pluralism. It's this insight that allows those of us who are practicing what uh, Sir John calls humility theology, or humility in theology, or the humble approach, the humility here is to recognize that there's truth in other sources and to be able to, uh, uh, to take that on board and to modify our own views. Now, I know that that's a challenging thought for many, and it may be too challenging for some, but if you're partaking, participating in this MOOC, chances are um, this is an issue that you've not had to deal with yet or that you have dealt with to such a degree that you are open to wisdom from traditions other than those that you're familiar with. So uh, one way of trying to actualize or make this uh, spiritual pluralism real uh, is to recognize, on the one hand, that the divine or ultimate truth far exceeds any one language's capacity to express it. And the second is to recognize that as a result of that, there are some aspects in religion that seem to be permanent. They're always there. You don't have religion without it. And there are others that change. It's a little bit related to the difference between religion and spirituality. What's, uh, what's different in each religious tradition? Generally, doctrine is different. I, I am a comparative theologian of religions. I tried for many years to come up with a kind of common doctrinal foundation for religious traditions. I won't go into the results here with you. What I will say is that if you try to, to uh, harmonize religions simply on the basis of a literal interpretation of their doctrines, you'll never find a common ground. Very, very hard to find any sort of unshifting, non-shifting common ground. So doctrine di is, is different in each religion, just like a Honda is different from a Mercedes. You cannot make a Honda into a Mercedes. They're both cars, but they're very different kinds of cars. Uh, an Android phone is not an iPhone. They're both phones. They're smartphones, but they're very different. And so similarly, uh, Christian doctrine uh, and, uh, and, and the doctrine of some other religious tradition, a Hindu tradition or teachings in Islam, quite different from each other, and there's no literal way to harmonize them without contradiction. Um, rituals uh, vary, languages vary, uh, diet varies, styles of dress vary. But what's the same in each religious tradition, what is always the same, and without this it cannot really be a religion, is that the, it, it connects us in some meaningful and life-altering way to the dimension of beatitude to the dimension of blessedness, to that immortal realm where all of the religions, from which the religions take their rise, and which they promise uh, they, ca they can reveal to us. That's the same in each tradition. Without that, we don't have a religion. Uh, we have religion, of course, as a sociological phenomenon, and so on. But religion as religion, religion as religion isn't sociology. Is sociology cannot capture that dimension of it. Psychology cannot capture that dimension. So religion as religion is, is that aspect of human life, that, re, that, that practice that relates us to divine or ultimate realities. So uh, that's a very quick introduction. These are short videos. Um, but uh, some, of the, um, some of the benefits of, of spiritual pluralism are clearly interreligious spirituality, such as this. If your tradition lacks something that another tradition has, you can perhaps uh, be influenced by that to change your tradition. If we really start creating friends with people in other religious traditions, making friends across religious boundaries, we can actually help to reduce the interreligious strife that is so much a part of our planetary uh, difficulties today. And actually, out of this can come the creation of brand new religious formations, religious forms. In fact, new religious movements can be seen as new blendings of what went before, like a new mix. There is a risk, however, 
Some of the risks include people losing their sense of traditional, they lose their traditional identities. They have a sense of being adrift in a world where the markers have been moved. And also for religious traditions that become perhaps less mindful of their boundaries, they can also lose social and cultural and political power. So there are risks to spiritual pluralism. But we'll talk more about how to overcome some of them in the next video.